All right, Principles of Microeconomics, Day 1, Chapter 1, Lecture 1. Let's get into what this class is going to be all about and start to uh, to build some of the tools of analysis that we'll be using throughout the semester. So where we have to start, of course, is defining what we in this class are going to do and what economists do in general. Uh, and uh, again, there's often a misconception about, oh, economics is all about money and spending and finance. Yeah, that's a big part of it, but it's much bigger than that. It's much broader than that, right? So a basic working definition of economics uh, is just, it's the study of the rational allocation of scarce resources among infinite and conflicting wants. So the study of how decision makers, us as individuals, companies, consumers, workers, governments, decide how to use their scarce resources. We can't have everything we want. We have to make choices. And the study of how those choices affect outcomes is really what economics is all about. So yes, a lot of the choices that we have to make on a day-to-day -day basis do involve money as a representation of scarce resources. But again, that's really not part of the definition. Right? So it's about scarcity and choices rather than money. And we throw this word around a lot just so we're all on the same page. What do we mean by a scarce resource or scarcity in general? Uh, that simply implies that the desire for the resource, whatever that may be, outstrips its availability. Demand is greater than supply once we get into that terminology. Right? There's not enough of it to go around. So it's there's only 24 hours in the day, and we've got a lot, a lot of things we'd like to do with that time, so we have to decide how to allocate it. There's only so many dollars in our bank account. There's only so many workers at the factory. How do we decide to use those resources? And what we'll see in a market-based trading system, the number one uh, indicator of scarcity is the price. Right. So the, the larger the gap between desire and availability, demand and supply, the more we're going to have to sacrifice to obtain that scarce item, the higher the price is going to be. And the flip side of that is if something is available for free, you don't have to sacrifice anything to obtain it. That basically indicates that it's it's not scarce. There's plenty of it to go around. If you need it, here it is. It's available, and you don't have to make that sacrifice. And if all the things that we wanted had that characteristic, there would be no need to have the discipline of economics uh, or study any of these tools of analysis that we're going to develop. So it all stems from the idea of scarcity. So when we talk about economic analysis, right, we're talking about creating models of this decision-making process, this resource allocation process. And in fact, a lot of the mathematical tools that we'll be using, we borrow from the other scientific disciplines. But because this is a social science, we're studying generally how people and institutions make decisions. We can't do that in a laboratory, right, to see how causes and effects relate to one another. So we need to generate these artificial representations of reality. Okay, So when we use that term, an economic model... We'll say it can be a very useful in explaining outcomes, making predictions, um, but they are limited, right? They are generally not equipped to provide ethical or moral instruction or judgments. So we can do a pretty good job of explaining the facts, how we got to a certain place or how an outcome uh, will affect individuals, but what the right answer is, what what we should be doing generally is outside our area of, of expertise or where we should feel comfortable making those judgments. Okay, So just to add again to our vocabulary here, we're going to say that we're going to focus on positive statements. That doesn't mean we're telling you you're doing a great job. Um, a positive statement simply means that we are stating facts as they are and making predictions based on these models rather than making what we would call a normative statement, which would be an indication of a 
an opinion or a moral or ethical judgment of what we think should be the case. There's a lot of gray area in between there. Um, and again, it's it's going to be useful to have these this terminology in mind, partly because, uh, again, it is a limitation built into what economists generally do and what we're able to do with our models. So we generally don't ask that of ourselves, right? Uh, but that can be a little bit annoying when you're first uh, getting into this. It's like, whoa, we've got all these curves and graphs and equations, and you can explain all these things. That's fantastic. But at the end of the day, you're still not able to tell us what we should be doing, what the right thing for society or individuals is going to be. That's not that's not in our in our purview. Okay. Uh, so just as a, a simple example, uh, an economist would feel comfortable stating. As Bay Area home prices have risen by 20% over the past decade, homelessness has risen by 25%. We might indicate there's a correlation there. We might even do the analysis to say that there's a causal relationship. But that's all based on facts, right? things that we can more or less prove in the data. So that would be a positive statement. Saying something along the lines that home prices are too high or homelessness is too high, there's too many homeless, those are opinions, those are should statements. X should be lower, Y should be higher, whatever the case may be, and those would be normative judgments. Okay. One reason why we would, again, shy away from those types of statements is that they, that they imply that we know what the optimal level is. Uh, and we can talk about the most efficient home price, whether it's too high or too low, to clear the market, to create an equilibrium, as we'll describe it. Uh, but again, as a moral judgment, too high or too low, we're not really equipped to say that. And another way to think about this in terms of the, the limitations of our analysis is that we're going to have a lot of focus on efficiency. So explaining or showing whether or not a system, a market, any given scenario operates in an efficient manner, and we'll define that specifically, versus equity or fairness. So a, a capitalist market-driven economy can be very efficient, but it can also lead to a large lack of equity, a big disparity between rich and poor. And that would be, again, moving into that value judgment phase. Not We're not saying we're it's not important, um, but again, our models won't be able to handle that. Okay. So what are we going to be able to do? Uh, as we said, economics as a discipline covers a lot of ground in terms of that definition of allocating scarce resources and the study of how that takes place. Uh, if this is your first kind of foray into economics, it's worth noting uh, that economics – uh, you know, has many, many sub-disciplines that are still grounded in that basic definition, that basic idea, but focus in on specific areas. So development economics studies why countries are poorer or richer and what policies can mitigate that. Behavioral economics delves into the psychology of decision-making. So when a consumer decides how much to spend on a product, we want to kind of look into what's actually happening in the brain, its psychology, overlapping with economics. International economics, same idea, scarcity, decision-making, resource allocation, but now across countries. So what determines the level of trade flows, capital flows across countries? Monetary economics, uh, again, economics isn't all about money, but this is so how does the supply of money in an economy, the control of interest rates within the banking system uh, and by monetary policy, how does that uh, affect individuals and the economy as a whole? So a whole sub-discipline there, economic history, how scarcity resource allocation has shaped world events and outcomes uh, across different countries and cultures over time. Financial economics, so there, how do firms uh, fund their operations, so debt versus equity, et cetera, still all about scarce resource allocation, but in a specific venue, 
uh, what we would call public economics. That would be the study of how governments fund their operations, taxation, borrowing, spending, what would be the optimal choices made by state, local, federal governments. All of that, what we could do is based on the foundation that we'll be developing in this principles of microeconomics class. And the big split, of course, in economics is between what we're going to focus on, the micro level individual decision maker versus macro economics. Um, but again, still based on the same overall scenario of scarce resource allocation. So when we talk about economic agents, that's a term that's going to show up. Those are the, the units at which decisions are made in microeconomics. So we as individuals are all economic agents, both as workers deciding what job to, to apply for, how many hours to work, what trading to seek, etc. And as consumers, where do we want to spend our hard-earned money? And over time, how much do we want to save for later? How much do we want to spend now? Firms that hire workers and make decisions on producing goods and services, those are economic agents as well. Governments as well can act as decision makers or economic agents. So microeconomics is all about looking at those individual decisions. We scale it up to a market level. So everybody that's in the market for education, for example, or everybody that's in the market for pizza, whatever the scenario is, but we don't zoom out to look at the entire economy as a whole. That would be the purview of principles of macroeconomics, where we spend a lot of time learning how to measure the health of an economy. We think of it as kind of taking the vital statistics of an economy as a whole. So looking at inflation, uh, output growth, gross domestic product, unemployment rates, average interest rates, etc., which all have microeconomic foundations. But again, we kind of zoom out at that point. So know the difference between micro versus macro economics. Um, even though this is not where we're going, uh, it is worth uh, thinking about the macro view of an economy because it also sets up what we're going to be able to look at for individual producers and consumers at the micro level. So when we think of an economy as a whole, uh, for our purposes, we can really think of it as a pile of resources, right? What we would call the factors of production, the things that are that go into generating the scarce resources that are actually consumed, the economic output, the goods and services. And when we think of those factors of production, so what can be combined to generate the consumable goods and services, the classic demarcation is that they are under one of these categories, they're land, labor, capital, and then there's the technology that's necessary to combine those physical resources. So by land, we just mean natural resources. Right? So it could actually be a an acre of land. It could be the sun giving us solar power. It could be the minerals uh, that are dug out of the earth, etc. And then the labor, the quality and quantity of person hours available. And again, just think of an economy as a big line of people who are willing and able to work. It's up to the society as a whole to decide who's going to do which jobs uh, and how much labor is actually going to be utilized. And when we think about the production process, there's that element of the physical tools and machinery that are used to generate output. So that would go under the capital category. And this can be a little bit confusing because we can think of capital as financial capital, raising money to fund your operations. In this context, we mean physical capital. So it's actually again, the tools and machinery that labor can use to be more productive. It could be a laptop uh, or a shovel or a machine in a factory. And then when we think of technology, that's basically measuring our, our efficiency, our ability to combine those physical resources to produce output. So if we think of the macro economy as this big pile of these resources that have to be combined to produce the goods and services people most want, 
micro level production occurs in the same way, right? Every firm, every company has land, labor, capital, and technology that needs to be combined to produce goods and services. And it's the economic question of how best to do that. Because you have limited land, labor, and capital. Those are scarce resources. How are they going to be allocated? Now, a nice way to condense our thinking, uh, again, at the, the macro view, and we'll zoom back in at the micro view, is to have this resource allocation scenario uh, kind of boil down to the three key allocation questions, right? What should we be producing? So what is the, the shopping list, right, that our society wants to see produced when we use those resources? How should they be produced? So what combination of land, labor, capital, and technology should go into producing computers versus cars versus education versus military defense, for example? And the trickiest question, who gets it, right? For whom are we producing these goods and services? So if an economy takes resources, combines them to get – and so going from a pile of resources to a pile of goods and services – well, now we have to divvy up that pile, right? Because we've got an unlimited desire for those goods and we have a limited pile of them available. That's a social question, somewhat a moral, ethical question of how how much equity do we want to put in? Uh, do we base, you know, who gets health care on who's the sickest or who's willing and able to pay the most? Those are, uh, again, equity questions, fairness questions, ethical questions, and every society has a different methodology of, of answering them. Okay. So how each economy answers those questions, again, essentially shapes the social and economic outcomes for everyone. And these are obviously based on historical elements, cultural elements, geography plays a role in how these questions are answered, and kind of the, the political moment in time uh, can change how a society answers these questions. So at the root of it, that is the economic question, right? For us as individuals, what do we produce with what we have available? How do we do it? Whom are we doing it for? And society as a whole. So now to get back on point, the micro view, what we're going to be focusing on in our class, of course, as we said, has a focus on our individual economic agents, individual decision makers. How do we, as those economic agents, operate within the environment of the macro economy? Right? So if we take as given how the macro level resource allocation questions have been answered the what, how, and for whom, we'll analyze again at the individual level how firms, workers, and consumers operate in that given, given environment. So what a microeconomic an analysis looks like really depends on the macroeconomic environment. In other words, every country, every society has different rules by which individual decision makers uh, operate, and that would change how we would do our analysis. For the most part, we are going to be focusing on how these economic agents interact and make decisions within a quote-unquote free market method of resource allocation. So what that means is Rather than having top-down, centrally planned government control of how those resources are utilized, what the rules of the game are, it's going to be based on the optimizing behavior of those agents themselves. Where the decision of what to buy, what to make, how, how much to sell it for are based on voluntary, self-interested exchange. 
So me as a worker, I'm going to go to the job that pays me the best and matches my skills the best. Me as a consumer, I'm going to buy the products that I want the most for the lowest possible price. And then as a producer, I'm going to try to pay the least amount for the workers and the resources that I'm going to use, produce and sell the products that people want to pay the most for and sell it for the highest possible price. So how those forces all interact, that's how the decisions are ultimately made. And that, of course, is where we are going to have our focus. So in a quote-unquote pure free market economy, we would be assuming every resource is privately owned. So all that land, labor, and capital, all those means of production, all those inputs are owned by self-interested producers rather than publicly or socially owned or government controlled. And all of those allocation decisions are based on voluntarily made decisions, self-interested decisions, greedy decisions, right? We're all doing the best we can for ourselves and the resulting interactions, right? So how much products sell for, how much revenue we can earn from selling them is going to reflect the level of scarcity, the level of desire versus availability, within the market rather than Congress, you know, uh, writing a law, enacting a law that says this is the price that you have to sell gasoline for. It can't be less than $2 a gallon and more than $5 a gallon, something like that. We're assuming that's not the case. And while we'll generally use that assumption in most of our analysis, in reality, of course, most economies are some mixture between top-down central planning government interaction versus bottom-up voluntary exchange pure market economy. So it's useful to think of there as being a you know a spectrum of uh, a range of free market versus central planning. Right. And if you're somewhere in the middle, some degree of government involvement mitigating those pure free market decisions, we would say that we are in a mixed economy. And as the level of government involvement, government control increases, we're getting closer to a pure centrally planned economy. So the, the typical list, and this does change over time, but uh, Cuba, Vietnam, China, North Korea, generally cited as uh, economies with a much farther along the spectrum towards a pure centrally planned economy. Individual decision makers have less of a, uh, well, less freedom, as it were, uh, to make those optimizing decisions. Um, more resource allocation decisions are top down made at the government level. And again, We'll get into this later on, uh, but thinking about, well, what is what's better, which option is preferred, that is somewhat of a normative decision, but it's generally, at least on paper, the idea is a trade-off between efficiency versus equity or fairness, right? One thing that a government centrally planned economy is good at is, at least hypothetically, they could be good at it, uh, is... Uh, equally distributing those resources, right? They decide who gets what, so they make the rules so they can make it as fair as they want it to. Whereas the market isn't based on fairness, it's based on willingness and ability to pay to get uh, the products and services that you desire. And the market economy is going to be therefore less equitable, but it's also going to be a lot more efficient. People buying the products that they most want that are being produced in the most efficient, most profitable way. But we would define the U.S., even though it is largely, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, most of the decisions we make and what we see happening is a market economy. There is definitely government involvement. Uh, it has elements of central planning. So we would depict it as a, quote-unquote, mixed economy. And while, again, much less severe than you would see in some of those other examples – the U.S. economy does have elements of central planning, right? So we have government involvement in the oil industry. We have strategic oil reserves that can be 
put on the market by the government when prices get too high. They can make it less scarce, push prices down. That's government involvement. Uh, I might have a demand. I, let's not say me. Somebody might have a demand for illicit drugs. <clears throat> they want fentanyl. They want heroin. Well, that's illegal. The government says you can't do that. That's a market that we're not going to allow to exist. Obviously, it does exist, uh, but not legally. So that's government involvement for good reason in that case. Uh, you can't just start a business on a whim and say, I'm going to start selling pies out of my kitchen. You need a, a license. You need safety inspection. That's government involvement mitigating pure free market outcomes, what we would call the social safety net, right? So social security, welfare payments, um, food assistance, et cetera. That's government reallocating resources, right? Outside the free market, it's making an allocation decision, again, for good reasons. Uh, zoning restrictions. You can't build a business in a area of town zoned for housing. It's a decision that the market might make, but the government says no. Military production services, that's largely a centrally planned decision. And of course, education. We have free public education, K through 12. That's outside the market. Right? So just simple examples of government involvement that pushes us away from that pure free market, more towards the middle of a, a mixed market central planned economy. And just as a, a quick example, one of the macroeconomic uh, scenarios that we are that we've been over the last uh, year and a half, two years is higher inflation than we had seen over the previous decade. So average prices rising faster and faster. And like clockwork, whenever that happens, there is a call for central planning. How can the government let prices be so high? Okay, so what do we do? We enact a law that says prices are going to be capped. We set a ceiling on those prices. Well, that's an outside of market resource allocation decision. Prices will no longer reflect the level of scarcity. They'll no longer be set in the free market. They will be centrally planned. We haven't seen much of that, um, but again, it, it, it happens every single time prices start to rise. Uh, you'll see a clamoring for the government to fix the problem, and we'll, we'll generate our models uh, that will show when that might be a good idea and what maybe some of the unintended consequences uh, may be from such a decision. Okay, now we're getting into it. So again, thinking about the micro view within the environment of a mixed economy, uh, our job is going to be to study the principles that govern optimal allocation decision making by economic agents, consumers, workers, firms, in a primarily market-based mixed economy structure. And a recurring theme that we're going to come back to again and again is going to be to compare and contrast what the outcome would look like in a pure free market and what government involvement in a given market might entail. What would be the normative ethical reasons uh, for making such an, an interjection uh, in a market outcome? What would be the intended consequences and what might be the unintended consequences? And we'll do that by constructing a measure of social welfare. And again, just to be clear on the vocabulary, when we say welfare, we don't mean government payments, getting a welfare check, right? We mean actual well-being, right? So social welfare is kind of the average level of, of happiness, of well-being of people in our society. We'll come up with a way to, to measure that based on market outcomes and how government involvement might increase or decrease that result, depending on the scenario. So in other words, when would a movement along that spectrum towards central planning versus towards pure free market be beneficial or harmful? When would it make more people better off versus worse off to move left or right? That's a distinction that we're going to want to be able to make. That's a big part of what we're going to want to build here. And how we're going to do that like we said, is going to be using economic models, simplified mathematical representations of reality uh, 
because reality is complicated and we can't do this in a lab, right? So we have to represent it with mathematical versions of these relationships and outcomes. And we'll use this for testing hypotheses and understanding causal relationships. And lots of analogies we could use here. Um, so you could think of a, a geographical model would be just a map, right? So when you bring up Google Maps or a, a paper map, it's a simplified representation of reality. And depending on what you're using it for, you might want more or less detail in that representation. So we're going to create some models of the economy or a market that are really broad strokes. That would be like, okay, I want to drive from San Francisco to LA. I just need to go know, you know when to get on the five and when to get off the five. Show me where the freeway is and I'm good. You're going to miss out on all the little streets and all the little towns along the way. It's not going to be very realistic, but it is going to be very useful depending on what we're, what we're trying to accomplish. And in fact, this is the great quote about specifically uh, statistical and economic models from uh, economist slash statistician George Box. He said, all models are wrong. Some are useful. In other words, don't expect a mathematical model to encompass all possible outcomes, all possible scenarios. It will be wrong in that sense. It'll miss a lot of details, but it can be very useful. It can get you from point A to point B without getting lost. So our job will be to be able to tell the difference between the two. So again, we'll never capture all the details, and you'll see complaints about this. Like, oh, economists, they use, they use equations, they use models, they can't possibly represent all the nuances in an economy. Yeah, that's true, and that's not necessarily what we're trying to do. Just don't want to miss the important things. So here now, finally, is what will be our first economic model. No equations, no graph, just kind of a flow chart. And you may have seen this before, but it's a good thing to always kind of keep in the back of our mind when we're thinking about market interactions and resource allocation is the quote-unquote circular flow diagram or circular flow model of a market economy. And when we think about market interactions, they are largely between households and firms. So when we say households, we're talking about individual decision makers, private citizens within society. And the way in which us as private citizens interact with the producers of goods and services, private firms, so not government making these decisions, but profit maximizing firms, is when we buy their stuff, right? So goods and services make their way do, 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 from firms into our house. So we go to Safeway, we buy cereal. That's goods and services flowing from the producers to households. And of course, this happens a lot, but you shouldn't just take it for free. You got to pay for it, right? So flowing the other direction is going to be the money. Payment for goods and services. So that's one transaction, one trip around the circle. And then of course, the other way us private citizens, households interact with firms is that we go to work, right? We supply our labor services and we don't do that for free. We get paid our wages, salaries, and benefits. Okay. So when we see in our little diagram, whenever there's an arrow, that is a transaction that's happening, one side of a transaction. So it's a flow from one side or the other, either goods, services, or dollars or time in the sense of labor services being provided. So this combination of, I think I'm getting a slide ahead, uh, C and D, that's what we would call the labor market, right? Buying and selling of time. A and B would be the goods market buying and selling goods and services. Money flows in one direction, product flows in the other. Now, one thing to notice in our little diagram, I think showing the, uh, the George Box 
uh, quote in action, it's not super accurate, right? It's a very simplified version of what we're looking at. There's no box that represents government. Where are taxes? Where are social security payments? Where is military spending? All of that. All of that has been set aside, right? So this would be a pure free market economy, as it were. No, it's as if no government exists. Some people would say, wouldn't that be fantastic? We're not going to go that far. But that would be the, the simplest representation of economic transactions, right? If this was a macro week on class, we'd really start building this out and add in international trade and, and government taxation, et cetera. For our purposes, this will be useful enough. Right? So all consumption, consumption levels, production levels, and prices are set in a pure free market interaction between households and firms. The supply and demand of goods and services, the supply and demand of labor inputs. Super simple, very microeconomic example. I'm not super creative, so I'll just think, hey, what am I doing right now <laughs> at this moment? Uh, for better or for worse, I am supplying goods and services to you. I am supplying educational services in the form of this video being, uh, being produced. So I am supplying my time, my labor services to USF, you are consuming the product being produced by USF in arrow A. Okay. So my time flowing to the firm from me, my household, is arrow C. And unfortunately, you are paying tuition to have access to this fantastic educational content. And of course, the degree, ultimately, that's what you're paying for. That's that arrow B. Okay. And that money does not go to waste because it ends up in my pocket, thank you very much, a tiny, tiny sliver of it as wages, salaries, and benefits to my household. Okay. So every transaction has this same element, these same four arrows representing payments, supply, and demand. So we can't really do anything numerically in terms of uh, making predictions or uh, uh, or social welfare analysis, but it's a really good mental picture to have in the back of our mind. And another way to think about this is kind of a roadmap of the, the gaps that we want to fill in with our later more detailed models what determines how much of that flow A versus B, C versus D are going to be. So we want to model those willingness to pay, willingness, ability to pay for goods and services for labor, willingness and ability to produce products and pay wages, et cetera. So we'll fill in those gaps as we go. Okay. So let's put a let's put a timeout right here and we will finish this off but this will be good enough for now and we will uh we'll continue this still within chapters one and two of our textbook before you know it thanks